welcome back to the United Stand. Happy Wednesday. And on today's show, will Gary O'Neill become a coach at Manchester United? A lot of people in the chat are getting confused. Manchester United are looking to bring Gary O'Neill in as a coach, according to Mark Ogden. How will that work? Do many too too many cooks spoil the spoil the broth is what they say. How how would that work? Is it a good appointment to bring in? Ineos are very serious about changing the structure behind the team. I'm going to discuss that. Also, Kobe Mainu getting player of the match on his England full debut. What a performance from him. If anyone did watch it, he is destined for absolutely massive things. I'm going to be talking about that. Also, an injury update on Tyrell Malassia, the missing man. We don't have a left back until the end of the season because there's also a bit of an update from Luke Shaw as well. From Gareth Southgate in the England camp, Man United will not have a left back for the remainder of the season, not for a single game it's looking like. How are we going to cope with that? Which way are we are going to go about things? And how important could Wan-Bissaka become for us? Also going to get into a little bit of a discussion because I saw Mark on the show last night speaking about selling McTominay and I wanted to kind of have a little bit of my say on that because looks like we could be selling Casemiro, definitely selling Donny van der Beek. Ericsson looks like he's going. Can we afford for another midfielder to go as well going to get into that discussion with you guys and get everything going in the chat but make sure you get your chats in as well straight away I'm running the poll would you bring Gary O'Neill in as the head well not as a head coach as a coach at Manchester United let me rewind would you bring Gary O'Neill in as a coach not the manager a coach because the rumor is that Ineos basically want to bring bring in a very highly capable coaching team behind the manager and a whole different coaching setup to what we've already got so let me know what you think in the chat and get voting in the poll but I want to start off with the news it's coming in from an article from Mark Ogden at the ESPN so let me actually get across what's been said here so starting off it is that Manchester United want to speak to Wolverhampton Wanderers head coach Gary O'Neill about a role in a potential new coaching setup at Old Trafford. Sources have said that the new regime, led by Ineos, director of sports Sir Dave Brailsford, are attempting to build a new coaching structure led by a head coach. And while no final decision yet has been made on Ten Hag's future as manager, sources have said that Manchester United have already assessed Gareth Southgate, Roberto De Zerbe and Thomas Frank as potential successors talk a little bit more because there is more stuff to bring into this article but basically reading through the lines in this article what it came across to me is that Ineos and Sir Jim are not looking at Gary O'Neill to replace Eric Ten Hag as manager they're looking to bring him in as part of the coaching setup now this bodes a few questions first thing is Gary O'Neill might have a completely different style of play to Eric Ten Hag how does that work in a coaching setup? That's a question that I have to kind of ask myself. Ideally, your head coach has a team of people behind them that are all all have bought into the head coach's style of play and all they're all on the same page. Gary O'Neill is, 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 is a manager for Wolverhampton Wanderers who are doing quite well this season, are a good club in the Premier League. To come and be a coach at Manchester United behind the scenes and kind of work with the main manager, is that something he would even want to do? Like, because everyone is a manager, usually you want to manage a team, don't you? You want to be the head coach. He's got a head coach role. It Wolves is doing really well. People are talking about him being in contention for the England job if Gareth Southgate left. Would you want to come and be part of a coaching team and not even kind of lead that? And Gary O'Neill is head coach at Manchester United. It's a no for me for now. I do think he's good, by the way, and I think he's got a lot of potential as a manager. As a head coach, for me, it's a no, but for him being behind the scenes, he definitely knows what he's talking about. He definitely knows what he's doing. He's he's highly, highly capable. But my question is, do too many cooks burn the broth or spoil the broth? Whatever the, whatever the term is, I don't know it exactly. But you've got high calibre of coaches in Eric Ten Hag, Gary O'Neill, and you know, you've got Van der Gaag there, and who knows who else they'll bring in. Is everybody on the same page? Obviously, Van der Gaag and Eric Ten Hag have worked together for, for, for numerous times. But if you're Eric Ten Hag, like, and Gary, you, you, you're getting given Gary O'Neill by Ineos and Sir Jim, he might not want Gary O'Neill as part of his coaching setup. They might not be on the same page whatsoever. How does that lead to things? I think there's a very fine line between building an elite coaching setup, which I'm all for, 
but also having people that are kind of dictating what is happening and the manager not really having any say in this. The manager at Manchester United, the head coach, needs to have a say on who his coaching staff is. He also needs to have a say on transfers. I'm not saying complete control, but they need to have a say. And what I'm kind of getting the vibes from for a lot of articles that are coming out is that Ineos and, and who they put control want who they put in control want full control of transfers obviously now the coaching setup how we're going to play i am and, and i don't want to get it twisted i'm completely on board with having experts in their field it, recruitment i'm completely on board with improving our coaching setup i'm completely on board with the fact that man united should have a defined style of play and each manager shouldn't kind of dictate a massive difference because that's where we're at now with loads of different players from loads of different styles of play. I, I'm on board with all them things, but there's a difference between, you know, complete control by Ineos and partial control. And I think it's getting that mixture right. If Eric Ten Hag remains as, as manager at Manchester United, he needs to have some sort of say. It's, it can't be a dictatorship. He needs to have some sort of say in that. And does Eric Ten Hag, is Eric Ten Hag, does Eric Ten Hag want Gary O'Neill as part of his coaching setup? That's the first question that you've got to ask yourself. But get in your chats down below. Any super chats you want to bring in as well, your hot takes, what sort of say you want to have, make sure you get them in the chat too. Um, happy Wednesday, everyone. Wednesday morning. Really interesting stuff, this. We do, we do keep getting linked to many different managers, um, even though it looks like Eric Ten Hag is is going to stay at this moment in time. Would you bring Gary O'Neill in as a coach, yes or no? For me, it's a, it's, a, it's a struggler. It's a struggler on which one I would pick. And the reason why is because I rate Gary O'Neill. I think he's a good manager at Wolves. I think the job he did at Bournemouth was great and I was really kind of surprised when they departed ways with him last season. He went on to get the Wolves job. He's done very well considering the amount of players they have to sell in the summer. And he is a good manager. I think he speaks really well. I would be open to him being part of the coaching staff at Manchester United. I would, I would definitely be open to it. But only if Eric Ten Hag wanted it. Because I think the manager should have some sort of say. And I want to stick with Ten Hag for now, but get your votes in. Daniel Farr says, Beth, you're presuming Eric Ten Hag wouldn't. I think it's about a complete overhaul. Eric Ten Hag moving upstairs and O'Neill as coach. Where's Eric Ten Hag moving to? He's, a man, he's Manchester United manager. He's not going to move upstairs to be a sporting director or anything like that. I mean, I hope not with his recruitment, with his recruitment record. But Eric Ten Hag is he's Manchester United manager and hopefully he will remain as that. And if Gary Neal's coming in, it's, it's, it's going to be as a coach behind the scenes. It seems like for now, from what Mark Ogden is saying, things could change. But he's a very established person to bring in as a coach behind the scenes. That's what I would say. Um... Nick Savage says Ten Hag must pick his own coaches. If he can't, then he's gone. Sir Jim must stick to the managerial setup. Ten Hag in. Do you think this is this is a question for you? And I'll get Mark Landridge's super chat in first. Mark Langridge says a manager is a Sir Alex, a head coach is a Pochettino, but they have no say on players, but still have a say on who is under them in the staff. Thank you, Mark, for your super chat. And Tristan, member for twenty one months. Thank you very much too. Do you think, and this is just me playing devil's advocate, because I have to reiterate it, I want Ten Hag to stay. I really am behind him. But do you think getting Gary O'Neill in as a coach behind the scenes is the first step into Eric Ten Hag being phased out of Manchester United? Because look at it this way. Ten Hag only has a year left on his deal. At the moment, to sack Eric Ten Hag, it had cost Ineos £10 million. That's how much it would cost, I think, if I'm not if I'm not wrong. Managers that they've scouted out there, Robert De Zerbe, he has a twenty million pound release clause. You know, we're not spending thirty million on managerial managerial appointments this season. It's just not going to happen, especially considering considering the situation we're in. Dan Ashworth isn't even in the through the doors yet. Omar Barada only comes in the summer. We've not actually put together the complete recruitment. Rep department we've not made the appointment of Jason Wilcox yet which looks likely to happen we've not got all of our ducks in a row and we know that the manager is going to be kind of the last one on the audit to go through the starting at the top and the working the way through to the bottom and the manager is below it is kind of below the recruitment department below the sporting director below the CEO so we've got to get our ducks in a row in terms of the 
the team behind the scenes first. And we keep hearing mixed reports. We keep hearing Ineos want to stick with Eric Ten Hag and they plan to have him in post for next season. They're planning the pre-season with him. They're planning recruitment with him. But we also keep getting linked to every manager under the sun. Yesterday, we were linked to Ancelotti. We've been linked to Southgate, like a bad smell that just won't leave you. Like, we've been linked to Southgate, like... There's, there's a smell in your house and you've tried everything to get rid of it and it just won't go. That's how we've been linked to Southgate throughout this international break. We've been linked to Thomas Frank a couple of times. Now we're getting linked to Gary O'Neill as a, as a coach, not a manager. We keep getting linked to different people. And I just think to myself, is this the first step in in Ineos phasing Eric Ten Hag out? He has only got a year left on his deal. They didn't pick him to be manager. And I hope it's not the case. The one thing that's kind of given me hope is Omar Barada at Manchester City, they would definitely have been looking at Eric Ten Hag. There was a point in time where the rumour was Eric Ten Hag could have been Pep's successor at Manchester City. I feel like someone with as much experience and know-how as Omar Barada will see the good in Eric Ten Hag and will see what he can bring to Manchester United in the future and won't be approving names such as Southgate as Manchester United manager. That's what I'm hoping. And we have been told, don't... I, I saw something... Yesterday, it was like, don't listen to the media when they say about Sir Jim is picking the next United manager. Sir Jim is picking what players were signed in the summer. Sir Jim's made it very clear he is building a team of people to make them decisions, a team of experts. That includes Omar Brada, it includes John Claude Blanc, it, in it includes Sir Dave Brailsford, it includes Dan Ashworth when he comes in. So Omar Brada will be making the decision over the manager. That's what, we that's what it we've been told by very good sources. I trust from what Omar Brad has done in his past and, and, and the amount of credit he has in the bank, I trust Omar Brada to make a good decision on this. I don't think Omar Brada would approve Man United man, next manager to beat Gareth Southgate. I also think Omar Brada would be very knowledgeable to know that Ten Hag is very well respected across Europe. He's been dealt a really bad hand with this, this Man United team. He struggled with injury after injury and underlying everything, there is some glimmer of hope. The way he's built the youth and brought Hobby Menu, Hoyle and um, Ganacho through. The way that he's managed to do Wembley twice, I mean, twice in a row. His first two years he's doing Wembley. How many Wembley trips will he have had? We had the semi-final of the FA Cup last year. We had the final of the FA Cup. We have the final of the Carabao Cup. Now we've got the semi-final of the the FA Cup again and you're hoping that after Coventry you'll get to the final that's five Wembley trips in two seasons with everything he's had to deal with the ownership everything behind the scenes the injuries the squad depth everything the, you know the Mason Greenwood the Sancho the Anthony like everything he's had to deal with so that's what I kind of take through with this that Omar Barada is a very 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 well established person in football who is rated highly and I think will will understand the situation at Manchester United. So that's what I kind of that's what that's what I hope for. That is what I hope for. Um hasn't missed a match yet at Wembley. Exactly. Exactly. I mean a little bit more on this story that I wanted to go into. So Gary O'Neill has been aware, made aware of Manchester United's interest with senior figures from the club expressing a desire to discuss his intentions. The role that United may be prepared to offer is not known, but aside from assessing managerial options, sources have said that Manchester United are also looking at bolstering their entire coaching team. So on this, like I said, I personally, from this article... Just, just, this is obviously the start of the murmurs about Gary O'Neill. We're not looking at him as a head coach. We're looking at him to bolster a coaching staff. And this is a question I wanted to ask. I mean, if you're Gary O'Neill, get in the chat. If you're Gary O'Neill, take out of the, take out of your mindset that you're a United fan. If you're Gary O'Neill, right now in your coaching career, you're the head coach, you're the manager of Wolves. Wolves are a mid-table team in the Premier League that are actually doing quite well right now with, with you as manager. And they've got some decent players. Wolves will always have to sell, though. Like, they're probably going to have to sell Neto. They're probably going to sell Jao Gomez. They're probably going to sell Aiton Nori. But they've got a decent team and they're doing quite well. If you're Gary O'Neill and Manchester United approach you for a coaching role at United 
you're part of the coaching staff, you're high up in the coaching staff, but you're not the manager. You're working underneath Eric Ten Hag. Do you leave Wolves to go and work underneath the, the Manchester United manager at Manchester United? Your head coach at Wolves, do you leave that to go and work under the Man United manager at Manchester United? Obviously, with that, you have a lot more chance of winning Champions Leagues, winning Premier Leagues, um, probably learning a lot as well behind the scenes. And you are at, a, at a, one of the biggest clubs in the world. But also, you've kind of taken a step backwards in the fact that most coaches leave and go to smaller clubs to be the first team manager. You'd be stepping away from being a first team manager. You know, you would like you would think that clubs like Wolves or them sort of clubs should be approaching our coaching staff to potentially go on and be managers. It hasn't happened in a very long time because Man United haven't been good enough. But you think that sh that should be the case later on. Like, you know, look at people that's worked under Pep and where they've gone on to, and, and how well they've gone on to do. Arteta is an example. Obviously, Arsenal's different to Wolves, but let me know in the comments, as Gary O'Neill, how would you go about that? Would you stay at Wolves and progress that way? I mean, a lot of people are putting you in for a shout as the next England manager once Southgate leaves. Or would you kind of take a step out of the limelight and move to Manchester United as part of an elite coaching setup where you're not the main man? Let me know what you think. Um, let me know what you think in the chat. Uh, Clinton says one step forward, two steps back. Um, both Eric Ten Hag and Arteta were under Pep at one time, says Chunky Chunk. Exactly. I mean, Ten Hag kind of, he managed obviously the Bayer, Bayern Munich B team, didn't he? And everyone's saying that's like going backwards. Exactly. That's what I mean. Why would he do that? That's that's the question I ask myself, which is probably why in the article Ogden said that the club have asked him what his intentions are because it's very unlikely that somebody would want to do that. Obviously, this might just be sort of rumours and there might be no legs in this whatsoever, but Mark Ogden, obviously, is a very, very well-respected journalist and it's an in-depth article, so it's something we had to get a discussion on. Um, but what do you think? Do too many cooks spoil the broth? Like, does that happen? Like, how would it work? I am in agreement that, for me, for me personally, Eric Ten Hag overall should be having a big say on who his coaching team are and ha should have a big hand in that. I mean, Jose Mourinho did when he was here. Pep Guardiola has a big say in who his coaching staff are. Of course they do. I mean, do you think, do you think Sir Alex would have just, like, had people have coaches appointed for him? Of course not. Like, a manager is, a manager is the boss they should have a huge say in who their coaches are. So I like the thought of Gary O'Neill coming in because I rate him, but only if Eric Ten Hag wanted that. Um, should, would Man United bring in Gary O'Neill as head coach, not as head coach? I keep saying head coach. No, not as head coach. Would you bring in Gary O'Neill as a coach? Yes, is 42% and no, is 58%. Exactly. Exactly. So you guys are quite split on this, but overall, most of you are saying no, and you obviously would want Eric Ten Hag to continue building his coaching staff for his own desire. I'm sure if I put the poll out, would you bring Gary O'Neill in as a coach if Ten Hag wanted that? I think it'd be massively on the yes column, because I don't think there's any any taken away from the fact that Gary O'Neill is a is a very very good coach that's doing very well in his managerial career. He really is. I rate him highly. So. If that's something Ten Hag was open to, I would say yes on that one. Franklin says, if I was told there was a plan to progress to become the manager, damn right, I would move. Well, this is what I mean. And this is where I want to go back to the point of, like I said before, is this the first phase of moving Ten Hag out? If you, if, if basically Ten Hag's got a year left on his deal and they don't want to buy him out, they don't want to spend a lot of money on bringing a manager in, they really like Gary O'Neill. Gary, will you come to Manchester United as a coach behind the scenes to work under Eric Ten Hag? Not really, because as much as I would love to come to Man United, I'm doing really well as Wolves manager and this is a higher position than what you're offering me. But look, we don't know what the future holds with Eric, Gary, and we really do like you. And obviously there's room for progression. Then that might start having a light bulb going off. I could be in for the job of Man United manager eventually, and it might not be that long. 
it might not be that long, especially with all the rumours around Ten Hag. It's, it's food for thought. It really is food, food for thought. Honestly, it is. But I don't see it happening that way. International 2675 seems a smart move by Ineos, thinking long term and may see the potential in him becoming a future manager for the club and possibly replacing Ten Hag. Exactly. That might be their long term goal. Bring him in as a coaching staff because why would Gary O'Neill take that if he wasn't kind of promised progression? And then... If things start to go south under Eric Ten Hag, you've got a manager, you've got someone there you, that you can instantly bring in as a manager, because Gary O'Neill has got experience in that. It's it's an interesting thought, it really is. Anyway, get in the chats what you think about that. Next topic I want to move on to is Kobe Mainu, one of our own, Manchester born and bred, eighteen years of old, eighteen years of age. I can't get my words out this morning. <sighs> I can't get my words out this morning, guys. Honestly, I think it's because I've not had my breakfast yet. I usually have my breakfast before the show, but I've just not had a chance this morning. I'm going to blame it on that. So, Kobe Mainu, 18 years of age, tearing England apart. Tearing Eng What is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? Tearing Belgium apart. What is wrong with me? Well, anyway, Kobe Mainu did brilliantly for England on his full England debut. That's what I wanted to get out. 18 years of age, the minority, a minority were questioning bringing Kobe Mainu in this soon into the England camp, saying, would he be getting that if he was playing for a smaller club? This is what happens when you play for Man United. Kobe Mainu deserves every single bit of success he's getting with England and he deserves every single minute he's playing. We saw that last night. He was fantastic. England... Different story. England as a whole under Southgate, they're pretty boring to watch and they don't look very exciting and they don't look as good as they should be considering the calibre of players they've got. But Kobe Mainu, two caps so far, his first full debut starting against Belgium and he was absolutely brilliant. And not only that, he took home man of the match because of how good he was. He's 18, like it's crazy. And this is a guy who only just started playing consistent, regular games for Man United in, was it in November time? He came back after his injury in pre-season. What he's done in the last six months is absolutely incredible and he deserves every single plaud that he's getting. The press resistance on him, the way he can just take on about three different players coming at him and kind of get out of it with the fancy footwork and then lay off a beautifully calm and composed pass is excellent. His press resistance is just is just incredible. I just want to say, absolutely well done to Kobe Mainu, and he's going to be a future star for England and a future star for Man United as well. The only thing I would say is, I just hope he doesn't get overplayed. That's the one thing I, I, I hope for, because as a young player, it's so easy to fall into that bracket of being overplayed, and it can... It can really hinder players across the across the career. Look at Pedri for Barcelona. I don't like to say it because obviously they're our rivals, but the way Pep Guardiola has managed Foden is excellent. If anything, Foden, I think, should have had more minutes for City over the years, but now he's a super important player for City, nearly starts every single game, which is hard to do because Pep rotates so much. And he's eased him in year after year after year. He's managed his minutes while making sure his development progresses in the right direction. And he suffered from little injuries because of that. And is an absolute brilliant player starting to come into his prime years. Phil Foden, he's managed him superbly. Obviously, we don't have that luxury because we don't have a squad depth that is full of players of an excellent calibre. Kobe Mainu, already at 18 years old, is one of our best players at Man United. And if he'd played from the start of the season, would be up for player of the year. Dallow takes it for me at the minute, but Mainu's right up there. And if he would have played from the start, who knows, he could have been up for player of the year at Manchester United, one of the biggest clubs in the world. So Mainu is doing brilliantly. As an England fan, I think he should start at the Euros. Like, let's not mess about. He starts a game at Wembley. I get it was a friendly, but... You're already a man of the match. Jude Bellingham has been arguably the best player in the world this season. Kobe Mainu just fit right in next to him. Fit right in next to him. Declan Rice 
is arguably been signing of the season and even maybe Premier League player of the season for Arsenal, a team that is in a shout in with a shout, a good shout of winning the league. Kobe Mainu just literally looks like the shining light out that midfield. Like the the sky is the limit for him. So super happy with Kobe. I think he's he the starting three for the Euros, I think it has to be Rice, Bellingham and Kobe. The only thing for me is I mean, you could even think, do you play Foden in the 10? But this isn't, that's football. This is Man United and this is the this is the United stand. So we'll save the England discussions for another day. But I just want to say a massive congratulations from Kobe Mainu. And he's going to be brilliant for both club and country, I'm sure of it. And this is why, you know, Ericsson can't get any minutes because Kobe Mainu, I mean, you just have to play him. He's so good. He's so good at the moment. And I think it's not just a one season wonder. I don't think it's just, he's just burst onto the scene. You can tell by the way he plays, the calmness, the composure, like everything about his game. He's so mature. He plays like he's been playing for 30 years. Like he plays like he's a senior pro. That isn't just a coincidence. That's something that stays with you. That's part of who he is. So, so excited for him. And Ten Hag deserves credit for bringing him through, by the way and managing him into this team. Remember that clip? Ten Hag, arm around the shoulder of Kobe Mainu at the Carabao Cup final when we won it. He knew what he was doing, and Ten Hag deserves the credit for that. Rory C, can't see this happening for two reasons. Why would Gary O'Neill take a step back in his career? And no chance we will pay the composition for a... Um, the compensation for a Premier League manager. Thank you, Rory. Very good points there in, in, in the chat. Obviously got to go through the news, but interesting. I wouldn't rule it out. Anything's possible under Ineos, but I understand your points completely. And Simon Roberts says, imagine having Eric Ten Hag, Sir Jim, and new better backroom staff in place. We could have had Hal and Bellingham with Manu, Ganacho and Ahmad coming through. Woulda, coulda, shoulda. That's the thing. You know, it's mad. You look at the England midfield, Bellingham, Rice and Mainu. Mainu is ours. Bellingham literally had a full tour of Old Trafford and we wanted to sign him, but John Murto couldn't guarantee game time. Wow. And Declan Rice, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer wanted years ago, but nobody listened to him. He wanted Haaland, nobody listened to him. Imagine, imagine we would have got that back in the day. Like, it's crazy to think where Man United could have been, could have been at. So getting better people in place behind the scenes is crucial. And this is the point I want to make. Um, I want to make. We have to do that. And I'm so happy that Ineos are taking that step in the right direction. We need people in charge of these areas that know the job inside out and know what they're doing. But the manager also has to have some sort of say. It has to be a team effort. It has to be a team effort. It can't be one or the other. It can't be Ten Hag has all the control. It can't be Ineos have all the control. You've got to have a partnership where Ten Hag is speaking above to Omar Brada and is speaking above to Dan Ashworth, but he also gets a say as well. I think that's I think that's the perfect perfect kind of thing that can happen. I also want to say on the England front before I before I move on to the time I'm Tyrell Malassia injury update. I, 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 me and Mark keep going for each other at the minute. Honestly, me and Mark get along so well and it's literally just footballing banter and, and just like kind of having a back and forth. But I saw Mark show saying he didn't want Ivan Tony at Manchester United. Why? Why? Rasmus is brilliant and I love Rasmus and I want him to be Man United striker for the future. I really do. I think he's excellent. I think he's absolutely excellent. You can't just have one excellent striker at Man United. Did you see Ivan Tony yesterday for England? Were you watching? Goldbridge, were you watching? Like, his hold-up play, the way he kind of brings in other forward players into play, the way he can hold up the ball, his aerial ability, his pace, his in-the-box presence. He's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. I don't get it. He's got a year left on his deal at Brentford. You need top-class strikers. You need more than one. City have Haaland and Alvarez. If Hoyland is what we think he is, he should be able to compete with Ivan Tony, And I think he is that. We're going to be playing Champions League, hopefully. We're going to be wanting to go all the way in cup competitions. You need two strikers. Rashford ain't a striker and Martial's going. Why not get someone who's proper top draw in there as well? So you know you've always got a top draw player in there to play as a centre-forward for United. Like, I actually, 
Um, a bit of an inside scoop for you. I did an interview with Brentford's te technical director that should be coming to the United Stand on Saturday as part of our build-up show. And the way he spoke about Tony, it was glowing. He was absolutely glowing. And some of you might say, well, obviously they want a good amount of money for him in the summer. But you just saw him play for England yesterday and, that, and he's with players that are playing for, you know, top Premier League clubs in title races. And he just did not look like a fish out of water at all. Stuck his penalty and he was actually making other players look better with the way he was bringing them into play, feeding them, the intricate passes, the hold-up play. It's exactly what we need at Manchester United. And I'm not saying to make Hoyland a bench striker. That's not what I want. I want Hoyland to be a starter. I want Hoyland to be ripping it up and I think he's got the capability to. But you need to. You do need to. I mean, look at Man United when they won the treble. They had York, Cole, Solskjaer and Sheringham. They were all brilliant and they all got game time and they were all important parts of that of that team. So that's where I kind of wanted to lead on that quickly. Next up, I mean, let's ha let's end the vote on would you bring Gary O'Neill in as a coach. He's ended on 60-40. Let's have a vote in. Let's put a poll in the chat saying, would you bring in... Which, what, poll, what poll should I do? Let me know in the chat what poll should I do. I was going to do an Ivan Tony one, but Mark did it the other day. So maybe we could do that one. Um, Basil Wazzle says, there is better than Tony without the baggage. If you're talking about the baggage, I reckon you're on about the betting stuff. He's not going to do that again. I mean, we don't know 100%, but the fact you wouldn't take a top striker just because he had, he had that, that betting stuff in the past, I don't think makes sense because obviously I can understand why people are dubious. You don't want to buy a player and then risk them having another ban, but well, don't you think he's learned his lesson? Like, wouldn't you think he's learned his lesson? He got banned for how long was it? Like nine, nine or 10 months? Like, sh surely that won't happen again, surely. And I don't think you should write a player off because of that. And people talk about attitude I spoke to the Brentford technical director and I say this again and I don't want to give too many exclusives because the clips are coming out. He spoke about his attitude being absolutely top level. He's a joy to be around, around Brentford. Thomas Frank has him as his captain. OK, Yeri has a bit of arrogance. OK, Yeri's mentioned about how he wants to go to a top, cl uh, a top club. To me, that shows ambition. It shows honesty and the fact he believes in himself. Top players, especially strikers, a lot of the time have a bit of arrogance. They have a bit of an attitude. That's 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 what makes them. That's how they can do it on a big stage. That's why I know Ivan Ivan Tony is coming to Man United and he wouldn't crumble under the pressure of, of, of the badge because he believes in his own hype. He believes in himself. I mean, Cantona had a personality. Like a lot some players do. That's that's my take on it. He has, I think he has the, the, the confidence in himself to be able to do it. And I think that's important because how many players have we got in that have kind of shriveled under the, the badge of Manchester United and, and not been able to do it at that level? Um, I don't think he necessarily has a bad attitude in terms of, you know, when the chips are down or anything like that because he's been banging goals in for Brentford no matter what the occasion. He came back from, came back from obviously his ban Brentford doing really poorly in the Premier League. He's just started banging goals in again. No problem. No problemo. So uh, for me, it is 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 absolutely the right person to go for. People talking about Ollie Watkins. Ollie Watkins is going to be absolutely crazy money. Crazy money. Tony won't be cheap, but he's got a year left in his deal. So Brentford will have to make a decision to sell him in the summer. I actually think on pure ability, Tony is just just better than Watkins. I think, but Watkins might go past him. He's been doing excellent this season. And Unai Emery's done an amazing job with Watkins. And Watkins, I do think, is very, very good, by the way. But just in terms of putting the ball in the back of the net, I think Tony's a better clear-cut finisher. Um, and then people bring up Jonathan David. And th this is what makes me laugh, you know. Mark will say he doesn't want Ivan Tony, but then he'll speak about how he's open to getting Jonathan David. And it's like, Jonathan David is not even half the striker Ivan Tony is. Why would you not... Why would you want someone that's, that's such a risk? I mean, obviously, everyone is open to their own 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 opinions, of course. But how many how many games really have you seen of Jonathan David? Like, he's he's decent, but that's the that, that's it. He's decent. It, you know, we we're Man United. We should have two top stop strikers. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, anyway, let's move on to Tyrell Molassia. 
and it's coming in with Tyrone Molassia injury update and it is from the Daily Mail that Tyrone Molassia's difficult recovery from a double knee surgery means he is unlikely to make his comeback before the end of the season. However, reports in Germany over the weekend claiming Molassia's problems to be as much mental as physical are somewhat wide of the mark. Wide of the mark means not accurate, basically. While Molassia has had to overcome the psychological challenges typically involved in any long-term rehab, the injury itself and several, several setbacks in his recovery are the reason he has not played this season. Molassia had problems with a damaged cartilage meniscus in his knee. He has spent some time at home in the Netherlands after surgery, but he's been working on his recovery at Carrington and he's focused on getting fit for the start of next season. So, on that, Finally, a clear-cut update on Tyra Molassia. We were all wondering where he was and we were all thinking the worst. I mean, when Romano said, you know, it's a really difficult time for the boy on, on my interview, I instantly thought, is this a career-ending injury? Like, that's where my, li my mind led me to. I always knew it was an injury. I always knew it was something to do with his knee. I didn't know the in-depth of it. But a lot of people always speculate on where people are when they're missing. I mean, we've seen that in the news with all sorts of things recently. Molassia is injured and it's a bad, bad injury. That is the rumour. He's not... I'm not even going to mention some of the theories that people have, have said about him because I think it's disrespectful. But he's injured and I feel massively sorry for him. I feel massively sorry for him. All he'll want to do is play football. He can't do it. Imagine thinking you're coming back time after time and just not being able to get back. Ten Hag was told he was going to be back in January. That's why they let Regulon go back. So they must have thought he was coming back. Malassia must have thought he was coming back. No, another setback and he's out until the end of the season. It doesn't look good because will he ever be able to come back? That's the question. But with Malassia, what happened was, from my knowledge, is he had his surgery in the Netherlands on his knee, didn't go according to plan, had to get the surgery redone in England and he's just had quite a few setbacks in his rehab and in his recovery. That's to my knowledge and understanding. It's super unfortunate for him, but also it's unfortunate for United because we won't have a left back for the end of the season. Going to move on to the Luke Shaw thing in a second, but we literally won't have a left back now until the end of the season. Till next season, we won't have a left back. Let that sink in. Manchester United, we won't have one. And it's worrying because will Molassia be, be the same player he was when he came through? Like a pit bull, we used to call him. You know, he wasn't exactly tearing the world apart when he came into Manchester United, but there was a lot of praise for him. He locked down Mares, he locked down Salah, he had some excellent games for us, he looked like he had a lot of potential. And he was great defensively. Going forward needed improvements, but he was great defensively. And a lot of people were saying how good he was and giving so much praise. Now he's missed a whole year, a whole year of his career, gone. He's going to be 25 this year. You know, you just hope he is able to come back and be the player that we thought he could be. But this is a huge, huge setback in his career. And I wish him the best recover and I wish him my well wishes because it must be horrible. Me, if I was a professional athlete and this had happened to me, I'd be absolutely devastated. So wish him all the best. But it's really poor for Man United because we're not going to have a left back. And are we ever actually going to get the player we thought we were going to get out of Malassia now? It, there's a lot of questions there because a lot of times people come back from these injuries like this where you're out for a whole year and you've had setback after setback and you're not the same. But the one thing, the one good thing that I would say from from this update is where it says that the reports of mental problems are wider the mark because obviously it's going to be tough for him coming through this this injury. But the last thing you want is is him suffering with that. So. Hopefully he keeps his head up and, and he can work his way back to full fitness, but it's going to be a long road, I think. I really do think it will be. Ron McCormack says Mark wants a backup only. I understand we've want only one. Actually, I don't. I'm not going to lie. I don't understand we've only wanted a backup because what you want at United, I'm sick of, I'm sick of this. We have a first team and then we have a bench and then when any of the first team players get injured... We're absolutely nowhere up to speed and the bench is a massive drop-off from our first team. I'm sick of that. Why would you go into a market of purely just a backup? Surely you want someone who can play first-team football as your second striker. You want someone who is good enough to play in the first team and win stuff with the first team. 
Because God forbid anything had happened to Hoyland and he was out for a few months. I mean, you want someone who's good enough to play as a centre forward and do well. I mean, look at, look at City. They don't have backups on the bench. They don't have backups. They have players that are good enough to play in their first team. Um, in my opinion. In my opinion. Um, and Rob McCormack again says United shouldn't sign backups. That is that is me as well. We're Manchester United. We should have we should have squad depth all over the pitch, and that's what we've been missing out on. And then moving on to the this show is going by so quickly because we've got some good we've got some news to talk about and we're having a great discussion. Keep the keep the opinions going in the chat. Let's get a poll going. Would you sign a backup striker or someone to compete with Rasmus? Let's get that let's get that poll going. And that's not saying we're taking away the spot from Rasmus. I have to I have to say it over and over. I think Rasmus is an absolute monster who's going to be a top Premier League striker. I think he's got everything. But that doesn't mean he knows himself as it Man United. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have someone else who is also very good too. So let's get the poll going. Should we have a backup or should we have someone who can compete? Um, on Luke Shaw, so I wanted to bring this in. Southgate gave an update on Luke Shaw that is not likely... And he's unlikely to be back before the end of the season. Yeah, Luke Shaw, Ten Hag said this. He probably won't be back before the end of the season. If we get to the final of the FA Cup, potentially, potentially could you have him back for Wembley? But are you really going to risk him when he's not played any games for a long period of time and he's just coming back from injury? I don't think so. So Luke Shaw, you might get him back for the last couple of games of the season. But it's, it, the most likely part is, is Luke Shaw is out for the remainder of the season. We won't have a left back until the end of the season. She's gutting for Manchester United. Like I've said, we've just got to keep our fingers and toes crossed that Dallow and Mal I nearly said Malassia that Dallow and Wambasaka can stay fit and won't get injured because we've had Wambasaka go through injuries this season. Dallow has been as fit as a fiddle and he's been so consistent. And I don't think he's actually missed a game for injury for United this season, which is massive credit to him. Um, and, and and he's amazing for us. So we've just got to keep our fingers and crows, toes crossed that Dallow and wan can stay fit. And if that happens, you're probably likely to see wan playing left back and Dallow playing right back for the remainder of the season. They might alternate it. wan did a really good job against Salah. Dallow, we know, can play both positions and he's been our player of the season. No problems with that. But they've got to stay fit and they've got to stay, stay consistent. And that's going to be a tough, tough ask for them. You know, it's a big running now to the end of the season. Let's hope they can stay fit, and I hope they do, because they're our best option. If best options at fullbacks, 100%. Especially when you're looking towards games like the FA Cup final, like Wambasaka will be huge in that game. Let's hope he stays fit, and we've not really got anyone to rotate them with, apart from Lindelof, which I'm not a big fan of. Maybe the last 20 minutes of a game, 30 minutes of a game, just to kind of give some rest to Wambasaka and Dallow, we'll have to go into. But I wanted to move on with Luke Shaw not being back before the end of the season. <clears throat> should he be going to the Euros with England? Mark said that he thinks he shouldn't be going. We said spoke about that on our group chat before before I went live on the 10am show. He says he doesn't think he should be going because he doesn't want him to rush back and put country over club. And he wants him to be fit for the start of next season for Manchester United. It's a tough one for me because I get Mark's point and if Luke Shaw isn't available for United before the end of the season, you've then got, you know, seven games with England in a month and Luke Shaw's likely to play all of them because he's going to be our first choice left back if he does play. We know how injury prone Luke Shaw is. The last thing you want is to be going into the season with Luke Shaw injured again because he rushed back to get fit for the Euros and... Now he's not available for United. The main priority is he's available for United. That's what we want. I've said it every time. When Luke Shaw's fit, he's one of the best left-backs in Europe. Sadly, he's injury-prone. He's not fit enough for us. But I also understand the point. This is a chance that, you're, that England have to win the Euros. And we've got a very, very, very good chance. Of course, Luke Shaw will want to be part of that and will do everything he can to be part of that. So it's difficult. The ideal scenario is Luke Shaw goes to the Euros, but he doesn't play for maybe like 
the first couple of games, gets back to full fitness, and then he's kind of, you know, maybe rotated a little bit in the game. That's what my part, part of car would be. I saw Ben Chilwell again last night. I'm sorry, he's absolutely not a patch on Luke Shaw. He's not a patch. Gareth Southgate will want to play Luke Shaw, but he does have options there. He has Chilwell and he has Trippier. And even Levi Colwell is an option. But Luke Shaw for me, I don't, I really don't hold anything against him for wanting to get back to go to the Euros because, you know, he scored in the final of the last Euros. England have a very high chance of winning it. I mean, maybe not with Southgate as manager, but he's going to want to be part of that. Do you remember when that time when Rhys James went to the Euros, but he didn't play until like, or, or they, they took him, but he was in. He went injured and then like he didn't play for like a few games while he got back fit. Maybe that can happen with Luke Shaw. I'm not sure, but it is interesting because you don't want him putting country over club, but you can understand why he wants to go to the Euros. But at the same time, this is another reason why United are in for a left back because Luke Shaw isn't reliable. He's not reliable and we need a starting left back. We do. As much as I love Luke Shaw, he's one of my favourite players, but we need a starting left back. And as much as Mark can say, you know, it might be a red flag for him to go and play country over club and what if he gets injured again? I get it. I completely get the thought process. He's going to go because he wants to win that. He wants a chance of being there. I mean, he went to he went to Wembley with the England camp injured and just, just to kind of be there and be around it. He's going to end up going in my opinion. But let me know in the chat what you guys think about that. We're going to sign a left back anyway, so hopefully it shouldn't be a massive problem, but Luke Shaw, we need to we need to get him into a point where he where he's consistently fit enough to be playing for Man United, but will he ever get to that point? How many how many times he's kind of been out? But get in the chat, should Shaw go to the Euros? Yes or no? Um would you sign a striker to be a backup or compete with Hoyland? Let me get in my chat. Oh, so a lot of you guys are agreeing with me here and you understand the you understand the magnitude of Manchester United and, and what we need to be the best. And 77% say to compete and 23% say to be a backup. So I'm glad the chat are on board with me with that this morning. LeBron James, Tammy Abraham to United, problem solved. Abraham, not for me. Not United level for me. Philip Sutton said Amrabat can play left back as well. Do we want to win games this season? Do we want to get Champions League football? I mean... I like Amrabat, but as a midfielder. And even as that, he's, I, I, I had so much hope for him coming to United, but he's not, he's not done what I thought he was going to do. But he's definitely not a left-back for us. Lindelof's a better left-back than Amrabat, in my opinion. And I don't want either of them at left-back. Sherlock says, better to have Tony in your team competing with Hoyland than let him go to Arsenal like Rice and make your rival stronger. Excellent point, Sherlock. Tony in that Arsenal team would do absolute bits. It'd be... He'd be scary. But I I heard Mark talking about how Arsenal are debating not going for him because of maybe, you know, behaviours behind the scenes. Please don't, because he would make you so much better. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about on this morning's 10 a.m. show. God, we're running out of time. The last little bit I wanted to say quickly is Brentford away. Absolutely huge game. We have exclusive interview with Brentford's technical director coming as well. Some really interesting bits in there, talking about Sir Jim, talking about Ivan Tony. That will be coming, talking about how they use analytics, how they do their recruitment. Really interesting insight, especially considering the new direction Manchester United are going down with Sir Jim. So stay tuned for that on Saturday. Cannot wait, cannot wait for club football to be back. I absolutely, I miss it so much. I miss, as much as I complain about, you know, dealing with the load on players and, and managing players. And this is why we needed a, a, a squad with depth. I miss midweek games so much. I miss Champions League. I miss European football. And when we've got the England, the England games and internationals, I miss watching United. So super excited for Brentford. We have to win. It's going to be tough. The reason why we have to win is we've got Chelsea coming up. If Brentford beat us... Chelsea have have the opportunity to go three within three points of us if they beat us at Stamford Bridge, which isn't out of the question. We've got to win. You know, there's all well and good looking up at Aston Villa and Spurs, which is what we should be aiming for. But you also got to look on, on, on the back of our tails. And, you know, Chelsea, they seem far off us, but 
it only takes a couple of results. Brentford, if if we are serious about trying to compete for that fifth spot for Champions League football, you have to win that game. It's a game you cannot afford to lose, especially with Chelsea and, and Liverpool coming up. Both huge games for us. So have to win that. And then the last little thing I wanted to say is, I saw Mark on his show yesterday speaking about getting rid of McTominay um, in the summer and cashing in. The one thing I just want to make clear is I've seen multiple reports saying that Casemiro is likely to go. I've seen multiple reports saying that Ericsson, you know, might be looking to get more game time elsewhere. Danny van der Beek's going to go. We're sending Amrabat back to Fiorentina. That leaves Bruno Menu Mount. Is that it? That's it? Unless I'm being really silly. Oh, oh and McTominay. If you get rid of McTominay as well, you're going to need three new midfielders. This is why I also don't believe United won't go for a midfielder in the summer. We're going to have to go for a midfielder. Obviously, there's Dan Gore and stuff behind the scenes that are coming through, but you don't know how, how good they're going to be right now. And it's a big risk to kind of, you know, invest in them for the season without seeing them properly play in the Premier League. So you've got to be careful. McTominay has been a very, very good squad depth player for us this season. I'm not, I can't believe I'm saying this, by the way, because I was also on, always on the bandwagon of sell McTominay and Fred. Like, if you're going to, even when it was McFred, I always said, you know, if we're going to sell one of them, I wanted to sell McTominay, to be honest. I liked Fred a little bit more. But credit where credit's due, I've got to give McTominay his flowers. He has turned up this season when we've needed him. He's won us point after point off the bench. And he's been a good squad player for us. He knows the club inside out. He's got a top mentality. He's physically fit. He's a professional athlete and he's got the right attitude and he knows the club. I'm not saying McTominay should be starting games. I don't think he should be anywhere near the starting eleven for United. But to have players like that to bring off the bench is important. It's a squad game. It's not a starting eleven game, it's a squad game. And that could be crucial again for us next season. Either if you need a goal off either if you need a goal to win you a game, you can bring him on the last twenty minutes, or if you're seeing out a result. Tell him to drop back and he's got the height and he's got the physicality. He's good to use off corners. He's an option. It's an option. And if you... Ericsson's going to go, I think. Amrabat's going. Donny van der Beek's going. You know, Casemiro might go. Of course, we've got to get a Casemiro replacement if he does go. And I would keep Casemiro, actually, for another year, I think. Um, but it's very likely he'll go because of his age and because of his wage. You've got to keep some depth there and McTominay is stability. I think he's going to end up staying and I don't think it's a bad thing. I'm going to be honest. I would be massively open to him staying as a squad depth player, not as a starter, as a squad player. And Ted Hag even knows that himself. You know, he said in the past it's been hard to leave McTominay out because he deserves to play. But at the end of the day, when Casemiro, Mainu and Bruno are available, that's his starting midfield three. So... If even if Casemiro goes, we'll buy another centre defensive midfielder, and his midfield three will still be the new centre defensive midfielder, Casemiro, not Casemiro, the new centre defensive midfielder, Kobe Mainu and Bruno. And you've got Mount to add on to that as well. Mason Mount needs to find his footing in this team. So keeping McTominay there as a backup squad player, if he's open to that, which I think he would be, I think that's a move that we that 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 suits United. To be honest with you, the only thing is obviously if you sold him, you're going to get pure profit which is the upside of, of 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 selling him but if you ask me now are you keeping McTominay as a squad player for next season I'm saying yeah I'm saying yeah I am it's a squad game Nigel Amrabat hasn't impressed in his loan spell I expect him to go back to Fiorentina exactly exactly but guys thank you for watching the show it's been a very good one this morning I've loved the interaction the poll on the striker has ended at 24% back up 75% compete with Hoyland I'm really glad we're on the same page as that because as United we need to be looking towards being the best and having the best and and we shouldn't be selling ourselves short but thank you everyone for a brilliant morning show on a Wednesday morning Mark is back for the 2pm show Get ready for that. I'm filming some interesting bits with Ricky today, so they could be out this week as well. Football is back. Club football is back on a Saturday night, 8 p.m. kickoff. 8 p.m. on a 8 p.m. on a Thursday. Not a Thursday. What is wrong with me this morning? 8 p.m. on a Saturday night. You know, usually I'm like, really? But this week I'm like, I'll be counting down the hours to it. I'll be counting down the hours to it. I'm so excited. We have to win this game. 
players are back. This is the final running till the end of the season. This is where it matters. Champions League football in an FA Cup, that's our motivation. That's our goals. We've still got some things to play for this season and I can't wait to go through it all with you guys. And yeah, stay tuned for the rest of the shows. 8 p.m. and 2 p.m. today. We'll see you on the next one, everyone. Please hit a like on the video on the way out and have a good day, everyone.